Thank you very much. Make sure I have all my microphones on here. I've got two different microphones. Are you good back there? And this one's good too. All right. Well, it's great to be back here at Central Methodist. Um, I've already spoken to a few classes today. So who's already heard me talk today? Go ahead and raise your hand so I know. All right, so don't blow the ending for everybody else, right? So let's, uh, let's keep, it, keep, it, keep it moving on. And I'll be honest, when I was asked to give the Gaddis lecture, I was a little bit nervous. And I'll tell you how it all started. I used to do a lot of work here on the campus when I was young and new in my career. And uh, then as the, as the career took off and I had to move around, I wasn't able to get back that much. So I got a phone call uh, from Dr. Kristen Cherry right over here. And she says, hey, we'd like for you to come back to campus and get involved in something, but we got to know how you feel about free speech. And I'm like, well, that's kind of a weird question. You know, I've been a journalist for more than 20 some years. I've written a number of books that are right over here. Oh, what a weird question. I said, yeah, I'd love to come back and do something. Uh, and just so you know, I'm a huge advocate of free speech. And she said, that's great because we need you to give one. <laughs> need you to do the Gaddis lecture. <clears throat> Actually, that story is not entirely true. But everything from this point on is going to be entirely true about the odd chain of events that happened from where I was sitting in your seat listening to a Gaddis lecture from somebody I have no idea who it was, talking about topics I had no idea about. And so I'm going to try and make this as interesting as possible. But the first class I spoke with today, I knew it was going to come up. And so I try and address this right off the bat. Because everybody wants to ask this question. If you've read my bio, if you've seen the videos, everybody wants to know this question first of all. And so I address it right off the start. Usually the question goes something along the lines of, what in the heck were you thinking? <laughs> All right, so that was more or less the end of the most bizarre 10 to 15 days of my entire life. And people have a lot of questions about how that happened. So we'll, we'll get rid of those first of all. Um, first of all, the number one question is, and I got this when I was on, it was either Entertainment Tonight or, or Access Hollywood or one of those. They said, what do you have against the Kardashians? And I said, I have absolutely nothing against the Kardashians. I just don't think they should be in the news every single day. And kind of the backstory here is our producer had put the Kardashians some random story, whether it's naming their bunny Bruce or whatever it was. And I finally said, if we get to this story, because there's about a three minute block that we had to talk to Jenny, our entertainment correspondent. Looked at my co-anchor and I said, okay, I can't do it anymore. If we get time to do the story, I'm out of here. I didn't think we'd ever have time to get to the story. So, you know, we all have the earpiece. The producer goes on just as she's wrapping up her other stories and says, you got more than a minute. And that's when I said, I'm having a good Friday. <laughs> I refuse to do it. And then people who know me, I'm sarcastic. I'm a bit of a cut up. And so as I walked off the set, you know, I walk off and we have our whole crew there, the guys behind the cameras. And they're giving me, you know, and then, then you really start getting whipped up, right? So what happened after I did, after we got done here, I put it on, 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 um, on, uh, on Facebook. And just thought, well, that was kind of crazy. We'll see what happens. And so I went down to see my wife and my kids. We were down at the, they were down at the Disney water park. And so I get down there and we're both sitting in these recliner lounger things and she said, are you okay? You seem distracted today. I said, did you see the show today? She said, no, I was getting the kids out. We were coming down to Disney. And I said, I did something on the set today that I have a weird feeling about and I don't know how this is gonna turn out. And so she said, you know what, no one's even going to remember it come Monday. Forget about it, just have a good weekend. So I decided I'm not going not to tune into any news. But I started getting alerts on my phone from people all over the country saying, hey, I saw your video. And I thought, well, yeah, they're seeing it on my Facebook page. So come Sunday night, I decide to fire up Facebook and see what news I missed because I'm on the air on Monday and I pull up my Facebook page. Okay. <laughs> In just a matter of days, this is my page alone, okay? 
My page alone had 2.8 million views, 5.135 million people reached on my page. Now keep in mind the Fox affiliate that I worked at, Fox 35 in Orlando, had also posted it. Uh, the Fox Network up in New York had also posted it. Their platforms are much bigger than mine. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? Well, what happened was over the weekend, some of the weekend cable shows and some of the others like Weekend Good Morning America, they started playing this thing. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I go to work on Monday and we're on the set. Uh, and I said, I'm going to address this issue and we talk a little bit about it. And while I was doing my own show, every network across the country picked this thing up and had it on their morning show. So on CNN, Chris Cuomo was doing the morning show at that time. He's calling for me to be fired. Right? This guy's so unprofessional, he should be fired. Uh, Good Morning America had it. The Today Show had it. Every single station in the country, radio station, everybody. Howard Stern's talking about it. This thing is going crazy. The show's about to wrap up. It's a 9 o'clock hour. I get a text from my boss saying, immediate meeting in my office. Fox execs want to talk. And I'm like, well, this is how it ends. <laughs> the, the career's been good. Thanks. I'm going to carry on now and go do something else. So, I mean, I'm nervous, right? You're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I got two kids. I'm about to get fired. And this is really spiraling out of control. And we go into um, our conference room there. And it's me. It's my boss and a few other people who are in there. And we have one of those space age phones, right, where people can call in. It looks like a UFO sitting there on the desk. And people start calling in. And there's you know, one of the legal people at Fox. And then there's the publicity person, the promotions person, the talent person. They're all on this conference call. And they said, John, we saw what happened. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> Who hasn't at this point? And they said, we've never had a bigger social media platform than this. Over the weekend alone, we could calculate 20 plus million views. Right? Those are the ones, unique views, not you know, share, share, share. Right? This is unique people, 20 million people worldwide. It was the number two story in the Nigerian Times. <laughs> right behind a tribe that invaded another tribe, number two, as news anchor walks off the set refusing to talk about the Kardashians. I'm like, I didn't even know there was a Nigerian Times out there, but I'm the number two story on this thing. And so they said, John, this is what's so weird about this, is usually when things go viral, unless it's a puppy or a laughing baby, right? We all get that. It's a 50-50 proposition. Somebody says something outrageous on TV, half the people are mad, half the people love it, and it goes crazy. We've never seen anything like this that, from the numbers we can see, is 99 point whatever percent positive. Everybody agrees with you. Everybody has had enough of the Kardashians. So we're going all in on this thing. You're getting your publicist assigned to you. She's handling the calls from People Magazine, uh, the New York Times, I mean, everybody. So all of a sudden, my entire day, and I'm not sleeping, right? Because you never know what's going to happen next. So now we're doing interviews all over the country. And then Perez Hilton, the, the celebrity blogger, you know, calls for the No Kardashians for a week movement. And this thing is just going crazy. And so it's starting to wind down. And then I still haven't slept. So we're about, I guess this was Wednesday. So I don't know how many days in, like five or six days in. And I'm exhausted. I can barely move at this point. And, and I'm like, OK, it's died off. It's about done. And I'm laying in bed, trying to fall asleep. And my phone was in the bathroom. And I hear my brother's ringtone go off at around midnight. It was like, ping. I'm like, dude, I can't talk to you. <laughs> I just don't want to talk to anybody. <coughs> and then it sounded like a Vegas slot machine in there. It's like, ping, 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 ping. It went on for like an hour. Because as this show was airing, rolling around the country, everybody saw it again. So it got new life. Um, and then finally it died out. But then came the big pushback. We had the Kardashians coming up against us. Because like I said, the Kardashians are doing what they're supposed to do. right? They're a business. And they were trying to shut this whole thing down. So they were coming back at me pretty strong then, too, in the network. And it seemed like everybody else. And then as soon as they would post something like this crusty old news anchor gets mad, and then everybody would shout them down. So that went away really quick. And so by the time it was all done, we had around 40 million views that we knew of worldwide. 40 million views, one of the biggest of all time. And then everybody, then came the whole, well, you set it up. You meant to do that. It was a hall of staged act. Well, OK, let's talk about that for a second. And this is things I know a lot of college and, and high school students always want to talk about. How do you go viral? I have no idea, quite frankly. You know, I was just being myself. We hit the right time, the right moment. But here's what's interesting about this. If you ever do something that you think is going to go viral, don't put it on Facebook. The lesson to this one is put it on YouTube because at 40 million views, you can monetize YouTube. YouTube will pay for some of their best videos upwards of 50 cents a watch. I'm talking $20 million. I put it on Facebook. Anybody dare to guess how much Facebook pays you for a video that goes viral? Zero. Zero. That's exactly right. They pay nothing. So I said, if I was smart enough to craft this entire thing 
to walk off the set at this moment, would I not have been smart enough to put it somewhere else so I actually, or somebody could have got some money out of it? So finally it died down and, uh, and the, Card you know, the Perez Hilton had his blogger thing and so it all went back to normal. But anywhere I go, that's still the number one thing. So I address it, we can put it to bed, and if you have any questions about that one, we can talk about it later, okay? That's one chapter of the, the bizarre story here. But as I was getting ready for this speech, quite frankly, I was nervous. Because it's tough to go home, right? This is still my home. I love Central Methodist. Uh, I've always had a passion for this place. But I'm thinking, what in the world am I going to talk about to this group? And I've given speeches all over the country, big groups, small groups. And, and I'm stressing because you know, you'll find I hate to waste time. I don't want to waste your time. This is only going to be like a three-hour speech tonight. So we'll all be out of here by 10. Uh, and I hate wasting my time. So I, that's the one thing I can't stand. So I want to make sure that what I talk about today is relevant to you. You may get a nugget here and there that's going to impact your life. You know, I know most of you, who's here getting extra credit? Be honest. All right, that was me, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, President. I'll sign off on it after the, after the show here. Um, I was just like you, right? I don't remember any of the Gaddis lectures. I don't remember what they talked about. All I know is I got some credit or Coach Sherman threatened me and said I had to be here. Right, fellas? I know how it went. Um, so I'm trying to come up with the best thing I can come up with. So I'm meeting with my peer group, right? Some of the top people that I know. And they said, well, OK, you've given a bunch of speeches before. Why don't you talk about your books? So I've written all these history books about Missouri. I've lived in 20 different towns, all in Missouri, before I uh, graduated from college. And some of you may even had to use that Missouri Legends. And if you went to high school in, or uh, elementary school in Missouri, your fourth grade history project, where you had to do a famous person, a lot of schools teach that one in there. And, but my friends here from Central Methodist, I was a moker back then, uh, they said, John, you're the only person who has actually written more books than you've read. So that's probably not going to be a good speech. Not entirely true. I have two books due out next year and one more following that. Then I will have written more books than I've read. But we're about even right now. I think I'm a four. So we're all still good. And I said, well, it's Missouri history. No, not the time, not the venue. I'm also the inventor of bib magnets, people who run marathons and races. You know, you hate the safety pins. He said, well, if it's a business class, talk about how you came up with the product, how you got the patent, you got the trademark, how you opened up a factory in China, and take them through that process. And I said, maybe if this is a business group, most people are going to be like, well, OK, I don't want to run. <laughs> so OK, no, another part of the story, I'm not going to talk about it. And then one of my brilliant mentors said, hey, why don't you talk about that research you did in 94? And there it is, right there, Missouri Academy of Science Journal, 1994, John Brown, C. Ed LaValle, and Dr. Rebecca Enix. And that's it. So if anybody's getting credit for your science class, write this one down, because it's the only science I'm talking about. Detection of mutagenic capabilities of EMFs using the Ames test. So they said, you should talk about that. And I said, that would be great, but I don't know what we did at all. I have no idea. We got it published. It took a lot of time. And Laval Ed LaValle there, he's a 94 grad of Central as well. He's a big time doctor down in the boot heel now. And what we found out was Ed was one of those guys who needed like two or three hours of sleep a night. That's it, right? And I need 12 or 14. So we would start our research. I'm like, Ed, I got to go back. I'm tired, man. Plus, there's a party out at the park. So. And Ed would stay up all night long doing this research. So we put this whole thing together. And guess who made the presentation? Me. Come to find out, he was good at the science. I was good at talking. <laughs> that was our good partnership there. And so maybe I should have known earlier on that uh, the degree in biology and minor in chemistry wasn't my thing. So there's for you science folks. And then finally, one of my mentors said, why don't you talk about how you did it? How did you go from being at Central Methodist, growing up in a small town, graduating in a class of 60 down by Lake of the Ozarks, coming to Central Methodist, we've all been there, <laughs> coming to uh, Central Methodist, right? Next thing you know, you're on Good Morning America. You're interviewing four presidents. You've covered numerous presidential campaigns. He's like, that's a cool story. And this guy knows my story. He said, walk him through. Show him how that works. And as soon as he said that, the light went off. I said, that's exactly it. Because I know the fear and the apprehension a lot of people have at this point. I found out about that today in some of our classes, people not knowing what they're going to do. And that's OK. Because I had no idea what I was going to do. And so I'm going to show you how this all played out, sometimes in miraculous ways. And one thing I always tell my kids, and I get it. You know, you're here for extra credit. One thing I tell my kids is, you might hear something three or four times, and it doesn't stick. And then somebody says it in a way that absolutely changes your life. So I always tell them, whether you're in church, whether you're at a presentation, if you get just one good nugget out of a speech, 
then it was well worth your time. Not only that, but it takes the pressure off me because at the end of this, I can say, did you get one nugget? You say, yeah. I say, well, that was a success successful speech. So I'm going to start with this because this principle that I learned right out of college and really changed my life is the one that all the others are based on because they all in my life go back to this. And it is simply this. It's work in the natural. Let God take care of the supernatural. Simply meaning, do your part. Work in the natural means do your part. Do whatever you can do and let God take care of the supernatural. Now I get it. Some people say, ah, why do you got to bring God into that? I don't believe in God. I don't think he intervenes in these cases. And I said, that's fine. You know, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it metaphysical dynamics. You can call it the spirit world. You can call it whatever you want. But what I do know is this has worked in my life. And all the successful people I've interviewed have said the same thing. That miraculous things happen along the way to take them from where they were to where they are now. But it all starts with working on yourself. And really, this entire principle right here takes the pressure out of no matter what you're going to do for the rest of your life, right? Because you can control this part. You can control the natural. That's the part where you say, I have to do whatever I can do, right? And you don't have to stress about the stuff that's going on out there because that will come together at exactly the right time. So if you say, well, where do I go next? I say, just start. You have to start. Start working on yourself, and you'll be amazed at how these things come into play. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up very quickly. So as soon as I left here, as I told you, I had a degree in biology, a minor in chemistry. I don't think I was a good student. Doc, was I a good student? Is I okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I say that because I was way behind when I got here. So I got the degree in biology, minor in chemistry, and that was in 1994. And for those of you, well, most of you weren't around then. That was the first debate over socialized medicine, right? That was the first time Hillary Clinton had put forth her plan. There was a lot of uncertainty in the medical field. My stepdad was a doctor down at Lake of the Ozarks. I had interned at all these hospitals, and everybody said the same thing. If you're not committed to this, don't go. And I'm like, well, that's great, because I don't know what I'm going to do. Because I got this degree, and I got student loans coming due here very, very soon. You know, I learned the word deferment for a lot of years. It's a word you'll get to know well. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And so my dad had always said, you know what, if you want to be in a career field, just start anywhere and then see where it goes from there. And so I moved back to St. Louis and got a job at St. John's Mercy Medical Center as a lab transport specialist. It's a big title, which was more or less I was an Uber driver for biology slides. I drove around the city of St. Louis all day long, picking up these biology specimens and slides and taking them back to the pathology lab and, uh, and thought, well, OK, I'm in the medical field. But what I found out was I was driving around by myself all day long listening to the radio. And I loved what I was hearing, how people could craft a story. And they'd keep me in my car for an extra five minutes when done well. And they'd tell these stories. And it was just amazing. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm OK at speaking. I think I could try that. So I started taking some radio classes. Well, about the same time, one of my coworkers um, was an actor in St. Louis. And he said, you know what? I have a talent agent. Why don't you stop by and talk to her? They're looking for guys right now that look like us. Just stop by and see her. So I did. So I signed with a modeling, talent, acting uh, agent in St. Louis. And I mean, you guys are smarter than me. I didn't get it. St. Louis isn't exactly the fashion capital of the world, in case you didn't know this, right? So I signed, but then there's no work. And she said, if you want to make this work, you've got to go somewhere. You've got to go to New York. You've got to go to LA. You've got to go to Athens, Greece. Uh, you've got to go to Miami. You've got to find somewhere where it's actually happening. So I said, that's it. I learned this principle from my mentor right after college. I said, work in the natural. Let God take care of the supernatural. I'm packing up my car. I'm leaving my house. Uh, I'm quitting my job at the hospital. I quit all this stuff, packed everything into my Sunbird convertible, and I headed off to Miami where I had a friend living. I said, here's my chance. I'm going to make it. Well, this was the days before cell phones. Okay, So I get to Fort Lauderdale. And I called Dirk. That was his name. And I was, he said, hey, I'm almost there. Right? His mom answers the phone. And she said, well, Dirk had to leave. He's in Chicago. His father got ill, and he moved. And I'm a single mom. I don't know you. I don't feel comfortable with you staying with me. All right? So now I have no house. <laughs> I have all my stuff with me, and I don't have a whole lot of money, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I told her, I said, I don't know what to do from here. I was, this was my plan. She said, well, talk to Pastor Jose Garcia over at Miami Shores Christian Church and see if he can help you out. So I called Pastor Garcia. And he said, well, we have a missionary room that you can stay in. Now, a missionary room at Miami Shores Christian Church was a broom closet with a cot. That's where the missionaries came in from Haiti, because little Haiti is just a little bit south of Miami Shores. And he said, but you can only stay for two days. And you're going to have to figure it out, because we have a missionary coming in, and you're going to have to go. And so there I am. 
laying in bed, never forget that night. I'm in a broom closet for crying out loud with a degree in biology and chemistry. I have no money. There's no way I'm calling my dad and saying, hey, this great experiment that I went on, quitting my job in the medical field, uh, didn't turn out so well. I'm sleeping next to a mop. Uh, so, you know, I'm just, I'm mad at God. And we've all been there, right? You're mad at something. You're mad at everybody. I'm mad at my car. I'm mad at the mop. I'm mad at the bed. I'm mad at God. I'm mad at everybody right now because, wait a second, I'm doing exactly what I was supposed to be doing and this is going nowhere. All I've been met with is opposition after opposition and, you know, it was one of those sleepless nights. I'm like, well, this absolutely stinks. I've blown it. Here I am at this point. I graduated later. It took me five years. Not ashamed of that. So I was around 24, 25. And I'm thinking, this is, this is not working out the way I thought when I left Central Methodist. I have a great degree, and I got nothing. So Pastor Jose comes in the next morning, and he says, John, how long are you thinking about staying in Miami? I said, I don't know. I don't have a plan B right now, okay? I can't even afford to get back home. And he said, I just got the weirdest phone call today. He said, the Sisters of St. Francis, which uh, was, a, was a convent group in Miami, they ran St. Francis Hospital. He said, they randomly called me out of the blue. I've never met these people. And they need somebody to watch their house. You want to go take a look? And I'm like, well, yeah. What else am I going to do? So we get into Pastor Jose's car. And we head over to Miami Beach. I'll set the scene for you here. OK. So this island right here, this entire stretch, this point right here used to be St. Francis Hospital back in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. And right across the bay, that right there, is a 20-bedroom house. So the nuns lived in a 20-bedroom house on Miami Beach. And for those of you who aren't familiar, this blue, that is called the ocean. That is called the beach. That right there would be called my house. So they need somebody to watch this place free for two years because they're moving. They packed up the hospital. They're in St. Bonaventure, New York. They're getting ready to build this piece of property, this high-rise, beautiful piece of property. That, by the way, was my garden. So they need somebody to watch it free for two years. He's like, do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> One, I have no house anymore. I stopped paying the mortgage right? when I knew I was coming down here. I have nowhere to go. Yeah, I'll take the 20-bedroom house. So I had a dock that went out into the intercoastal waterway. I had this, which was the hospital still there, mostly flat land, where I learned to rollerblade. And Miami Beach was about a mile that way, the mecca of where I was wanting to be. Right? All of a sudden, things are starting to click. I signed with a modeling agency. But here's the problem with that. Uh-huh, right? Back in the day. When I showed up in Miami Beach, that was when everybody who looked just like me, their agents also sent them to Miami Beach. They wanted that Hispanic look, dark complexion. So yeah, you get an occasional job like this one I got for Kodak, but an occasional job means like one job a month. Because there were, we'd show up for casting calls, and they're looking for a dark hair, six foot, 175 pound, and I'm like, there's 75 people in this row, and they're only going to choose one. I said, that's how we stayed so skinny. We didn't have any money. We couldn't eat. <laughs> so, so again, you know, you get an occasional job, and now I'm, I'm living in this place, but I still have no money. St student loans are coming due, car payment. And I'll never forget the moment. I put in my ATM card, and I had no money left in the bank account, right? I had no money left in the credit cards. They were all tapped out. I had three credit cards, whatever it was, 15 grand on each one. I had nothing. Student loans coming due, all this stuff at once. And I'm in that same position. I'm like, OK, here I am. I'm still not figuring this out. There's no way I'm calling my dad saying it failed. I'm not going to call him to bail me out. He wouldn't have bailed me out. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm in this position. I said, you know what? I came down here because I wanted to do radio. So I'm going to go to a radio station. I'm just going to ask for a job. I don't care what the job is. My dad's principle was just go take any job in whatever it is in the field that you want. Eventually, the money will catch up. Eventually, the opportunity will catch up with your passion. So I went to WQAM radio, which is uh, north of Miami. I show up at the, at the front, and I, it was the days before online job postings. And I go up to the receptionist, and I say, I just need a job. Here's my resume. Do you have anything? She said, let me, let me contact Andrew Ashwood. He's the program director. Andrew comes out. He's a legend in the broadcast industry. He comes out, looks at my resume, says, well, he was familiar with Central Methodist. He knew about it somewhere along the way. Said, uh, OK, you obviously got a good degree, you know, sports. You played basketball. You played golf. He's like, my morning show producer just let me know he's quitting yesterday. Do you want the job? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> didn't find out how much you paid. Didn't find out anything. Took the job on the spot. Now, here's the other problem. I have no idea what a morning show producer does. Okay? 
He said, come back tomorrow, we'll finalize the paperwork. So I'm flying high now, right? I show up the next day, front of the entrance, I said, I need to see Andrew Ashwood. She said, he's gone on business. I don't know why he told you to come back today. He's gone for several days. I'm like, I'm supposed to get a job today, <laughs> right? I'm here to fill out my paperwork. She said, let me contact Human Resources. Human Resources comes out and he's like, what job are you going to take? And I said, well, apparently the morning show producer quit and he offered me that job. He's like, what's it going to pay? I'm like, I don't know. We didn't talk about it. He's like, you took the job and you didn't ask how much you paid? I'm like, no, I just need a job because whatever you're going to pay me is more than I'm making right now sitting in my 20-bedroom house, which is zero. <laughs> and he said, well, Andrew should have been here today. So full-time, check. Benefits, check. How about $8 an hour? I'm like, again, that's $8 an hour more than I'm making right now, so yes. Right, so suddenly, here I am, living in a 20-bedroom house, Miami Beach, radio market number 16, producing the number one sports talk radio station in Miami. The star of the show is this guy right here, Joe Rose. He caught Dan Marino's first touchdown pass. He was a tight end for the Miami Dolphins for a number of years. And this is where it gets weird. Like, if it's not weird enough at this point, this gets weird. So I start producing the show. Joe is well known in Miami, not only because of his playing days, but because of this radio show. He was also uh, the sports anchor at the NBC affiliate. Joe knew everybody. You know, Dan Marino was one of his best buddies. So we had the hotline in there. The hotline rings. And I'm like, WQAM, this is John. Hey, this is Dan Marino. Let me talk to Joe. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have Dan Marino on the phone. It's like, just put it through. OK. Don Shula. Oh, I have Don Shula. He's like, okay, it's okay, man. It's all right. Put it down. It's Gloria Stefan. You know, all, this, these, all these celebrities in Miami at this time are all calling, and then I'm getting invited to their house. You know, I was saying, I'm hanging out in Julio, you guys would remember the name, Julio Iglesias. Old folks, Julio Iglesias. Enrique Iglesias' father, right? I'm standing in the lobby of his house, right, as Enrique Iglesias is getting ready to have that huge chart topper. I'm standing there, and I'm like, I mean, it's like a 14,000 square foot mansion on another island, close to my island. And, um, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, just a few months ago, I was at Central Methodist, <laughs> not knowing anybody famous, not doing anything very cool, and here I am hanging out in Julio Iglesias' house, and Enrique Iglesias is right there doing his thing. All these other stars are all over the place. And then Gloria Stefan, you know, one, two, three, four, I don't know if you know her. Um, she comes up, huge star. She's like, hey, I love your show. I'm like, what? You know me? I went from nothing to all of a sudden, you know, being in one of the biggest media markets in the country, hanging out with these amazing celebrities. You know, I'm in the locker room with Michael Jordan. I'm working at the Miami Heat. I'm just, all these amazing, the rock is down there as so he's finishing up college. It's just one of those surreal moments where I said, how in the world did this happen? And so after my two years are up, I go back to St. Louis, and, and I get a job there. And part of my job there was to be on these different radio stations around St. Louis doing news. It was Metro Networks. So I did that for a while, then I want my own show. So I get my own show out in Pennsylvania. Go out there, it becomes the number one show in central Pennsylvania. And I'm not real happy there, though. I mean, it was not the right fit for us. So I go to Springfield, Missouri on vacation, and I show up at the ABC affiliate there, and I say, hey, I need a job. And he's like, well, guess what? Our 10 p.m. producer just quit. <laughs> Again, right before I got there. And I said, OK, I'll take the job. Again, ask me what a 10 p.m. producer does at that point. I have no idea. But again, from Pennsylvania to there, it was another pay cut. But as my dad said, just take the job, get in there, your passion will take you. So we get to, I get to Springfield 33. And they had me doing this weird thing in 1999. It's called the web desk, right? The internet was new. And I was the only one who knew how to use it. So they put a camera on me right there. And I'm looking on the internet, and I'm telling people what the biggest stories are. Well, the general manager comes in a couple days later, and he says, you're John Brown. You were doing radio up in St. Louis, right? And I said, yeah, I did it a little bit. He's like, I used to listen to your show when I was up there. He was a news director in St. Louis, and now he's uh, the general manager in Springfield. And he said, you know, we're starting a new morning show. But the woman that we want to do it just said she doesn't want to do it because it's a new startup show and she doesn't want to go through this whole process. And he's like, so we're looking for somebody who had background in radio and TV and kind of an irreverent morning show. Do you want to do it? So again, I walked right in at the exact right time. After working super hard, these opportunities kept presenting themselves. Next thing you know, three months later, I'm hosting a morning TV show with no experience. The show went well, did that for a couple of years. I get promoted to the evening news anchor in Springfield. And 
and now I'm wanting a whole lot more, right? I'm working hard, I'm doing all the right things, I'm making the right contacts, but I just feel like I'm topped off. And so I signed with an agent who handled uh, a lot of network talent. And he's like, John, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna work together. And so he starts pitching me, even though I had a year in my contract, um, he starts pitching me, he's like, dude, there's no interest in you. For whatever reason, you know, I thought you were the right look, I thought you had the right presentation, all this stuff, but nobody's showing any interest at all. And I said, that's okay, I got another year. My news director, who's now a very good friend of mine, comes through the newsroom one day and says, John, I need to talk to you in the office. And so I'm like, okay. He says, okay, the new company says we have to take the bonus structure out of contracts. And now, I'm, I'm thinking this is not a good thing. Now, don't get me wrong, I never got a single bonus the entire five years I was there, right? It was a ratings threshold bonus, I never got a single bonus. And I said, no, I'm not going to take that out of my contract. Not because of the money, because I never saw the money, but because I'm thinking, well, I don't want to change my contract. You guys wouldn't change the contract for me, so I'm not going to change it for you. He said, okay, we're going to have to let you go. Because as you will learn when you sign contracts, there are things in contracts called at will. <laughs> Look for that in a contract, which simply means they can let me go, I just couldn't quit. So difficult situation. So here I am again, standing on principle. I'm not going to change my contract to, I have a new baby, I have a wife, I have a new house, I have a car, I have all these things, and I'm about to get terminated in market 73 before my career ever took off. And then I get a phone call. The following day, if I'm lying, I'm dying. The following day, I get a phone call from a radio friend up in St. Louis who said, are you familiar with the Daily Buzz? And I said, yeah, it's a TV show, it's on all over the country. He said, nobody knows this yet, but their morning show host is about to quit. He has a job up in New York with ABC News. And they need somebody like today, because they're moving from Dayton, Ohio, down to Orlando, Florida, and they're about to be on 100 more cities, and they need somebody in place immediately. I'm like, well, hook me up. So I go down, do the audition. Audition goes great. They hire me right on the spot. Right? I got this job. We go back, look at the contract. Contract was nice. <laughs> but think about this. Had I not been terminated the day before, I couldn't have capitalized on that opportunity because I was still under contract for a year. So don't tell me there's not something bigger out there that came in and said, this opportunity is about to present itself. I got to make a way. Don't accept that deal on your contract for getting rid of the bonus. And I didn't. And that allowed them to terminate me, which allowed me two weeks later to be nationally syndicated, going from Springfield, Missouri, Market 73, to hanging out with some of the biggest celebrities on the planet. Living in Orlando, Florida. Much, much better contract. <laughs> much, much more pay. And everybody says, well, how did you do that? How did you go from this to this? I said, I don't know. But you know what I do know? When I was in Springfield, I was working hard. I was always working on myself, doing the little things, making the contacts, doing everything it took because that's the part of the equation that I could handle. The rest of it I couldn't. But the part that I couldn't handle was about to come and when the two come together, that's when success happens. It's that analogy you guys have always heard. Success is where prepara uh, preparation meets opportunity, right? You can't control the opportunity, that's out of your hands. You guys getting out of uh, college in a year, two, three, five, six, whatever it might be. You can't control the opportunities, there might be a recession. There might be a presidential race going on, so companies aren't willing to hire. That's the stuff you don't have to worry about. There's nothing you can do about it. The only thing you can do something about is making sure you're prepared. So when those opportunities do present themselves, something like this can happen. And ever since that moment, similar situations have uh, turned themselves around. I've been able to interview some of the top, even the Wiggles. I put that in just for you guys. So I know this generation, you guys saw the Wiggles growing up. That was an awkward interview. My question, because you're kind of, I don't even know if I should go there. So, so, I, yeah, so I ask him, it was a little red car, right? He said, the Wiggles are in a little red car. And, um, and so I started asking him all kinds of questions about dating in the little red car. And it didn't go well with the Wiggles when they were trying to reach a child audience. So anyway, so it went like that. And all of a sudden, these things keep happening time and time again. And as I'm interviewing these successful people as I moved on through my career, I find out they all had the similar stories. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to transition to some of the things they've said that all buffer back to this because these are the things that are going to take you to the next level as you get out of college. And they can also benefit you right now. Outwork everyone else. And here's a hint. It's not really that hard. This goes to an interview I did with John Q. Hammonds. Springfield folks, I know I have one right here. 
If you've lived in Springfield or if you've ever been to Missouri State, you know the name John Q. Hammonds. Hammonds' name is on everything in Springfield and he just passed away a couple of years ago. I'm doing an interview with John Q. Hammonds. At that point, you know, the, the list, you know, how wealthy is this person? They had him at like $600 million, right? He was one of the first franchisees of, uh, of Holiday Inn, built a lot of hotels. And I said, what's your secret to success? And he said, people ask me that all the time. And I say it very simply, I say, get to work. And he said, if you're going to be a janitor in my organization, be the best janitor. If you're going to be my accountant, be the best accountant, no matter what it is. And he said, he can immediately tell who's going to make it to the next level, who's going to be promoted to the next level, and who's not, simply by what he called Hammond's math. And he said, eight hours per day, right? You've heard it your entire life. How much do you work? Eight hours a day, nine to five. We've heard that. There's even a song by Dolly Parton about it. He said, so think about it this way. Johnny said, what if you put in an extra 30 minutes a day? Not that much. You know, that's maybe skipping your lunch break one day and putting in a little extra work, doing a little extra reading. What if you stuck around a little later? You know, instead of going off to the bar and having a beer or in this day and age, you know, and doing TikTok, whatever it might be. <laughs> I, I have teenage daughters. I, I see enough of that. So he said, what if you did that? That's not that much. Would you notice a difference after the first, first week? He said, probably not. Second week, 30 minutes a day, you're two and a half hours a week after the first week. Sorry. That equals about 10 hours per month. Are you noticing a difference? He said, probably not. Most people won't notice a difference after your 10 hours per month, but you're starting to notice. You're starting to get a little more competent in your job. You're starting to know a few things here and there that maybe you didn't know before. And he said, but 120 extra hours per year is what that equals out, out to. 30 hours per day. He said, 120 extra hours per year. That's nearly three weeks more per year than you're putting in the people you're competing against. Are you going to start to notice a difference? He said, if I have two people and I both bring them in as entry level people, the one person's doing the nine to five, the other person's putting in at 30 minutes a day, you start to see a difference. That's when everybody starts to notice. And he said, was it really that hard? The odds are probably not. It's that simple to be promoted in his organization. Tony Little, inventor of the gazelle, he called it continual daily improvement. And he used a similar kind of situation, similar kind of math. And he said, yeah, if you just put in a couple minutes a day, are you going to notice it after the first week working out? You might be a little sore. No one else is going to be able to tell. After the first month, maybe three months, people say, hey, you dropped a couple of pounds. You're doing good. After a year, you're going to notice a significant difference by continual daily improvement. And he said, again, it's not that hard, but it's just doing little things. And so he said, do you mean to tell me if it's evident in our fitness life, right, things you can tell, where you have more mental clarity, where the clothes fit a little bit better. You know, all these things, right? You have more energy because you're working out. He said, you mean to tell me it's not the same in business? Because Tony Little is a very successful businessman. He said, if, you, if you're going to notice it in your fitness, of course you're going to notice it in your performance on the job. So again, just these little things day in, day out is all it takes as far as they're concerned. And that goes back to one of the ones I heard early on. Overnight success typically takes about 15 years to accomplish. Because see what will happen is you see these people who spring onto the, the scene all of a sudden, right? No one heard about them yesterday. Today they're a big star. You see with athletes, you're like, wow, where'd that guy come from? And you know what people will say? Boy, you sure got lucky. I heard it all the time when I got to the Daily Buzz. Wow, you went from market 73 to nationally syndicated on 175 stations. You sure got lucky. You know what they didn't see? They didn't see that I was working two jobs the entire time. They didn't see that I was working on my own tape nonstop, the little things, day in, day out, working harder than I possibly could, harder than anybody else possibly could, because those were the principles I knew that it took to be a success. And so again, you see these people splash onto the scene, but just know that doesn't happen. These people have worked incredibly hard their entire lives, and then finally they get to the point where they're up here, and everybody looks and says, wow, that guy's lucky. Here's the next one. Your true character is determined when nobody else is looking. You see, it's easy to be a hard worker, this person told me, when everybody's watching you at practice, right? It's easy to work hard in practice when everybody's watching. What are you doing when nobody else is watching? Are you working harder on yourself than you are on the job? That's when you start to see the big changes here because, as Colin Powell put it, you can fool people by looking busy, but your performance will always be in relation to the work you put in. I mean, this guy. He hasn't been in the news much lately, but you know, Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was top level in military, top level in government. I mean, this guy cuts right through it. You're doing an interview with him, and you better be strong because he is looking right through you. 
This guy is so intense, and in this interview, he said, you can fool people by looking busy, but your performance will always be in relation to the work you put in. And here's how he put it. And like I said, sometimes somebody says something and it sticks with you. Somebody else can say the exact same thing and it doesn't. Maybe it was his gravitas. He said, in my organizations, I can tell who's mailing it in and I can tell who's working hard by the moment I see him walking down the hall. I said, how do you do that? He said, the guy who's mailing it in, stealing from me, is the word that he used. You know, I'm paying your salary and you're on Facebook all day, right? Whatever it was back then. He said, I can tell because when I'm coming down to the hall with them, they're like this. Right? Body language. Gave them away because they know they're not doing the right thing. The subconscious, he says, gives you away. Because your subconscious says, ooh, I probably shouldn't be seeing my boss right now because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. On the flip side, he said, I can see who's going to be promoted by walking down the hall because that person stands a little taller. That person's shoes are shine just a little bit brighter. That person has everything going on because their own body language is showing I'm working harder on myself than I am on my job. So what people at this level can tell you certainly know people all over the country can tell. Governor Rick Scott, interesting story by the way, Governor Rick Scott uh, is now Senator Rick Scott. He's from Kansas City. This guy grew up in the projects in Kansas City and grew to be one of the wealthiest men on the planet. He also paid one of the biggest fines in history for stuff that went on at his health care plan. So just because somebody has it all going right doesn't mean everything's going all right, right? People still have flaws. He said it this way. When he got into government, he said, he sees this too much. He said, stop running in circles. Make sure your effort actually takes you somewhere. Because he said, people would start out the day and they're busy, right? You ask somebody, how are you doing? Oh, I'm busy. Really? What are you doing? I don't know. He said, he sees people running in circles, running in circles, not doing anything. And at the end of the day, they're right back where they started. They made no progress. And now they're exhausted and they've made no progress. Right? The biggest mistake you can make in business is not making that progress. And so people are running in figure eights, doing this kind of stuff, and getting nowhere. And so that's what he said. Make sure your effort actually takes somewhere. If you're going to be that busy, make sure you're moving forward in your career. Now I show this picture. That's right outside of your office, Doc. 1994. That right there is Stedman Hall before the redo, before you guys got here. And I show this picture. This was in the town in 1994, and I'll never forget that day. Because the photographer came up took this picture, I had no idea he was doing it. And that was right outside Doc's uh, office there. And he said, John, it's Friday night, what are you doing here? And I said, I gotta study. I'm way behind everybody else. So even as far back as that, I knew that I wasn't at the level of my competition. At that point here at Central Methodist, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Doc, we were named the number one pre-medical school in the entire state. We had a lot of top-notch people coming through here at that point. I wasn't at their level. If I was going to make the grade with them, I had to work extra hard, and I knew that. And so in order for me to compete here, that's something I adopted back then. And yeah, it meant giving up a few things on the weekend, but I didn't give up everything on the weekend. Let's not, let's not go that far. I still had some fun here at Central. But a lot of weekends, that's where you would find me. Because I had to adopt this work ethic early on. And it's benefited me through my entire life, just knowing that people are going to have a better pedigree. People are going to have better connections. People are going to have more money. They're going to have all these things. I can't blame them because it's not their fault. So I can either blame them and not move ahead or say, I'm going to work a little bit harder on myself and that's how I'm going to succeed. So I want to show that one. Here's the next one. Successful people do the things that failures fail to do. It's an interesting saying, but what it simply means is when you hear somebody, whether it's in school, on the job, in athletics, in performances, whatever, when somebody says, I would never do that, that's when the light has to go on. When somebody else says, I would never do that, your light has to go on and say, that's exactly what I need to do. Because if somebody's asking you to do something, they need some help, right? You talk about a way to separate yourself from the others. So now you'll start to hear this time and time again. You'll say, why aren't they doing that? Because they don't want to move up. So it's something that I need to incorporate into my life. So one of the sports psychologists that I talked to, he puts it this way. He says, the difference between amateurs and pros is their daily habits. By the time you get to the pro level, by the time you get to the top-notch level in almost any industry, everybody's pretty much even, right? If you're watching some of the NBA players practice, they're about the same. But he said the difference here, and he used baseball as the, as the analogy, all these guys look like they can do the job. But the guys who end up in this level, up in the pros, and the guys who get stuck in the minors, Look at their daily habits, and it's little things like this. He said, meditation. See if they're doing the little things to get their mind right. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm horrible at meditation. 
I've been told time and time again I need to do this and I'm awful at it. Jack Dorsey from Twitter, when I interviewed him, he said the first thing he does every morning, he gets up and he meditates. And then he walks six miles to work. I said, nah, I live in St. Louis, that'll never work. But first thing he does, 30 minutes of meditation every day. So did Michael Jordan, so did Oprah Winfrey. So of all these other people, they all say they meditate. And like I said, I'm horrible at it. My wife does it every morning. If I get up to meditate, so I said, well, set your alarm an extra 30 minutes early and meditate a little bit. I set my alarm an extra 30 minutes early and close my eyes to meditate, guess what? I'm back asleep for another three hours. Now I'm way behind, so I'm horrible at this. So I'm working on this stuff too. The next one, goal setting. Every single person I've ever interviewed says you have to set goals. So if every one of these highly successful people says you gotta do this, then what's the problem, right? I started this right out of college. I still have my goals back to 1994 when I was first told this. Not only is it that important, every month, the first week of every year, I go and I set the goals again because of the impact these guys have had on me. We set a one year, a five year, and a 10 year goal to make sure I'm on the right path. Because as you're going through your day in, day out world, you got your one year goal over there and all of a sudden I'm distracted, right? I got ADD, I'm over here. Look at my goals again the next day, I'm like, whoa, I'm supposed to be over here. It keeps you on the right path. And that's the key with goal setting. Again, all these top notch people say they do it. Reading, again, I've apparently only re read four books in my life, I've written four, but this comes from, um, a number of people. Lee Iacocca, before he passed away, said he read two business books a week. Uh, Warren Buffett reads a business book a week. All these other great people. Mark Cuban says he reads at least three hours a day in his chosen field because he wants to move up. So if they're doing it, what's the problem, right? It's these little things that start to set you apart. And then almost all of them say, you know, diet and exercise. We all know that that helps you. So again, these are just basic things, right? Just throwing out a few ideas. If all the top-notch people in the country say that they do these things, then those are probably some things that we ought to adopt. And after I've heard it time and time and time again in all these interviews with top newsmakers and celebrities and athletes, it starts to sink in. You say, wow, you know what? That stuff really is that important. I bring this one up. I was going to leave this out because it's kind of redundant, but I have to tell the story about Lou Holtz. Excellence is the key to success. One of my favorite interviews of all time. If you guys aren't familiar with him, I've interviewed him several times. Lou Holtz was the legendary coach at Notre Dame. One of the best college coaches of all time. You spend an hour in his presence, your life has changed. It's just one nugget after another. And I love what he said here. Because this made sense to me because the way I sometimes practiced when I was on the basketball team and everywhere else. He says, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And he used it this way, he said, if you're practicing all day long, but you're practicing wrong, are you getting better? He said, how are you going about your day in, day out tasks? He said, perfect practice is what makes you perfect. And here's why. He said, well, when it becomes natural on the field, you don't have to think about it when the stress is on. Your body just reacts in a perfect fashion. He said, people would watch our practices at Notre Dame and they would see us run a play and everybody would say, that's a pretty good play. Lou Holtz would see something so minor, he would stop the play and they would do it again. And you're talking what? You guys, a few football players here, 100 degree heat, you're doing two a days. He's stopping every single minute to redo a play until it's perfect. And then he says, once we have it perfect, we run it perfect time and time and time again. And he says, because at that point, excellence not only becomes the culture, it becomes the expectation. Simply meaning, as a leader, as you guys will be in your fields, as a leader, you don't wanna have to teach people every single day. You want to set the expectation that when you're there, the people behind you are still going to act in a perfect fashion. Coach Sherm, who couldn't be here, hi Julie. Coach Sherm is on his way back from Springfield, right? If he knows that he has put the right culture in, in, in to the players, if he has to be gone, he knows that they're going to continue this because it's become the culture, it's become the expectation. That means the players say, well, wait a second, we're not just going to mail it in, we're not going to kick balls around here, we're not going to throw them underhand, because this is our expectation. We perform at such a high level, that's the way we do it. And I'm telling you what, if you get a chance to read his book, it is a life changer. He says stuff like this all the way through it. I got done with an interview with him, and I take notes during the interview, I was like flipping through like 60 pages of good nuggets, and these are just three of them that came out from his interview. Don't buy into the negativity trap. And I say that because... You guys see the news. You guys hear all the time. You're the generation that's gonna come out to an America that's worse than it's ever been, right? You see it all the time. Things are falling apart. Things are so bad in America right now. Says who? Says the most vocal people on social media? Says the most vocal people in their industry trying to push an agenda? 
don't buy into the negativity trap and it's easy. Whether you're around work, whether you're you know, on the job, whatever it might be, it's easy to fall into this. And here's why I disagree with that. Earl Nightingale said, this is the period of time that man has dreamed about since the beginning of time. Man has always dreamed about a, a, a period in time when you could communicate with anybody around the world. Man has always dreamed about a time where you could get on a plane and be across the world in just a matter of uh, hours. These, now I didn't interview him because that was like 1900. I'm not that old. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it makes this point that just think of all the things that are around us right now, that things that we didn't even think would happen. I mean, think about Hyperloop. I don't know if you guys have followed this. We're getting ready to open, if we get it, uh, a train system that's magnetics that goes from St. Louis to Kansas City in 30 minutes. And you can hold a cup of coffee. It's right around the corner. People couldn't have even imagined that. You can communicate with anybody. You guys can get on the phone right now and see your mom, your dad, or anybody, right? These are things that even when I was here, we dreamed about. And now we're experiencing these moments in time, and yet everybody's saying, wow, America's falling apart. Is it really? Chris Hogan, author of Retire Inspired, one of my very good friends, he says this. He says, if you think times are tough in America right now, you need to have a talk with Grandma. <laughs> and he said, think about what my grandma went through in the South. And he tells you stories about what his family's experienced, and you're going to say times are tough right now? You need to call Grandma and see what's going on. I'm writing a book right now where I'm laying out the case that this is the best time ever to live in America. And people completely disagree with me. I've interviewed people who said, you know what, I got rich when there's a Republican office. I've gotten rich when there's a Democrat in office. I've gotten rich when there's a recession going on. I've gotten rich when things are going well. So why is it some people continue to do well? Think about this. Access to education. In America today, pretty much everybody has access to education. If somebody wants to go to college, you can pretty much find a way. That wasn't always the case. Standard of living. People are driving some pretty nice cars, living in some pretty nice houses, right? I can show you some of the shanties I grew up in. And now you don't see those anymore. People have access to a better standard of living. Overall health. I mean, think of some of the things that they're doing right now. This, this is one that blows me away, right? I even have family members who believe this. I don't have the watch on right now. I have a watch that tracks all my vitals, right? It tells me if my heart rate's up. It tells me how I'm doing with my blood, everything, right? So I have a family member who says, that's the man right there. See, they're taking all your information. They're going to find out that you're something, and they're going to cancel your insurance. OK, that's one way to look at it. Or you could look at it like the guy that we just did a story on who was wearing his watch that told him you're about to have a stroke. Right? Which way are you going to look at it? Is it an invasion of your privacy, or is it moving forward in the right direction? Crime. So much crime in the news. How many crime stories do you think we do? I'll, I'll give you the numbers. About 10 crime stories a night, right? A city of 2 million people. So somehow we found 10 people doing the wrong thing. How many people are doing the right thing that entire day? Right? That doesn't make news. Yet we see this stuff, and we think everything's falling apart. Crime rate's actually way down since the mid-1990s. Murder rate in St. Louis, you hear about it all the time, most dangerous city in the country. Murder rate is way off from what it was in the 1990s. People don't want to look back in history. They just want to think it's the worst time ever, because a lot of times, if you say it's the worst time ever, what's that give you? It gives you an excuse. Well, I can't perform. Look at how bad things are. But that's not how everybody sees the world. Entertainment options. You guys can watch a movie, right? Some of you probably are. <laughs> you have entertainment options. And the palm of your hand literally these days, right? Did, how, how was grandma going to see a movie, right? She didn't. There's a record. OK. Uh, indoor plumbing, <laughs> right? That's a big change. You guys have always been around that. Some groups I talked to didn't always have indoor plumbing at that point. Women in advanced careers. I'm sure if you're looking at law school or medical school, you've seen those numbers. There are more women than men in medical schools and law schools across the country right now. African-American business owners, like Chris Hogan says, there are more African-American business owners in the country right now than there have ever been. And the fastest growing group of millionaires in America today are African-American small business owners. So again, how was it 60, 70 years ago? So I, I challenge you on this one. I know it's tough. I'm in the news business, for crying out loud. I see it all the time. Don't buy into the negativity trap. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Akande, he put it this way. He was the president over at um, Westminster. Now he's at Washington University. He told me this. He said, John, nobody's risking their life to get into France or China or Russia. People are literally dying to come to America. So when you hear stories like that, you see what people are doing just to get here. Yeah, I know we got problems. I know there's a lot of stuff to work on. But 
you know, it's probably part of our fault by focusing on the negative so much. But you have people like him who came from Africa. He's seen what it's like other places. That's his perception on it. I believe him. Next one here. This is kind of a news thing, but it also works for you as well. Always question the source. And here's why. Because in any walk of life, whether it's in the news business, whether it's in your own life, everybody's got spin. Everybody's got an agenda. Yes, mom has an agenda. Mom wants you to act a certain way, that's spin in the news business, right? So no matter who tells you something, you just got to know that they're going to try and spin you. My boss used to preach this all the time. This is Newt Gingrich. He was the Speaker of the House during the Clinton years, during the impeachment, one of the most brilliant people you'll ever meet. I get a chance to do an interview with him, and this is where the light went off for me. I said, okay, uh, Mr. Gingrich, I'm going to ask you these questions. He said, you can ask me whatever question you want. I'm going to give you whatever answer I want. Like, really? You can do that? <laughs> and now when you watch the news on the weekends of political shows, you're like, oh my gosh, that guy didn't answer a single question. That's because they have an agenda, right? It's our job to be strong enough to, to call them on that. But as I told the earlier groups, I had an interview with President Trump before he was president, asking the same question four times. He never answered it. I stopped. And then people got on to me. Why didn't you stick it to him? I'm like, well, how many times do I have to ask a question if he's not going to answer it? Right? So just know. In politics and in life, everybody has an agenda. Everybody's trying to spin, so question the source. Don't let the opinion of others define you. And this is one I had to work through for a long time. I interviewed John Cena and Kurt Warner right there. John Cena told me such a cool story. And this was our Christmas card, by the way. I had John Cena pose with our family for Christmas card. That was kind of cool. Because my youngest daughter right there, she loves Nikki Bella. If you watch wrestling, you understand that whole conversation I just had. Yeah, right. Um, John Cena said, as I was coming through the ranks, everybody defined me as a dumb jock. Everybody defined me as a wrestler. All I was was a wrestler to them. He said, I didn't see myself that way. I saw myself as an entertainer, as a smart entertainer. And he said, had I bought into what everybody else said, when my wrestling career was over, guess what? I was over. But he said, that's not the way I saw myself. So as I was wrestling, I was working on my business life. He was working on all that stuff that nobody else could see, and now you see where he is. Kurt Warner, if you don't know his story, one of the best interviews of all time. Kurt Warner, Super Bowl winning MVP for the St. Louis Rams. After he graduated from college in uh, Iowa, everybody, a lot of people have heard the story, he was stocking shelves at a Hy-Vee grocery store. People defined him as a grocery store worker. Dumb jock, washed up, already did your thing, time to move on to a career. Work at the grocery store the rest of your life. He says, as I'm stocking shelves, I'm seeing myself as a Super Bowl winning MVP quarterback. He never gave up on his dream. Sure enough, opportunities came about. He was the backup quarterback the year the Rams won, if you guys don't remember that. The only way he got in was the starting quarterback got injured, Trent Green from Kansas City. Kurt Warner had been working on himself the entire time. When the opportunity came about, guess who was ready? And he didn't allow others to define him as they saw him. He said, no, that's not me. And I, and I turn to this, and I haven't told this story. I, Doc, you probably don't even know this one. Sometimes it's hard for me to tell this story. So I moved around a lot. Like I told you guys, I lived in 20 different towns in Missouri all before graduating. And I moved to one small town, and I was struggling in school. And so back then, they didn't do testing. They put me in a remedial class. They called me slow. So I sat in a little room down by the cafeteria, and I read by myself. And I'm like, well, that's why I can't understand things. I'm slow. I'm separated from my class. I'm down in this room. Maybe that was a sign, because the room I was in also had mops and brooms. So <laughs> it's a sign of coming attractions. So there I am in this room trying to learn the remedial math, learn the remedial parts of speech, all this stuff. And I'm like, boy, I'm dumb. I don't know what I'm doing. Years later. My mom said, you know, that was so weird that happened because we had your IQ tested and you tested very, very high. You were almost in the genius level. Michael, like, well, I wish you would have told me that then. <laughs> Here I am defining myself as slow. But you see, what happened was we bounced around school so much, we didn't have standardized education back then to where things were taught in a certain fashion. We bounced around, well, it just so happened I missed all the parts of speech. I missed a lot of math concepts. I got the states and the capitals like every school I went to. So by my fourth school in sixth grade, I certainly knew states and capitals. For whatever reason, I had that at every school. But I missed this other stuff. But early on, they were saying, well, you're just slow. And so you start to say, OK, well, maybe I am. So maybe I'm just going to focus on sports. I'm not a good student. I'm not a smart guy. So this is my reality. I'm slow. And you know how long that sticks with you? A long time. 
But what I decided even as a kid, and I've adopted this my entire way, and when I heard it put this way, I said, well, that's kind of what I was doing and didn't even realize it. Use the difficulties and failures as motivation. And that's probably why I went through this program that was pretty much over my head. Even though I did fine, like I said, I had to work really, really hard. Because I think I wanted to prove that I wasn't stupid. Right? Everybody has their own thing. You know, you're the small town kid. You're the fat kid. You're whatever. And people have defined you your entire life, and that can hold you back for years. And it's not based on evidence. That's the dumb thing about the whole thing, right? The evidence actually showed my IQ is incredibly high. But what did I do? I bought into what someone's opinion of me was. And I let them have complete control over me, which impacted my life for 15, 20 years. And I still joke about it. But it was not based in reality at all. How dangerous is that in your own life? To where you believe something that's absolutely not true, but somebody defined you. And they weren't being mean. They didn't know, right? That was in the 70s when this happened to me. They weren't being mean. They weren't trying to call me a slow kid. That's just, I mean, the kid can't read, right? He doesn't know his math. You go to the slow room. OK. I'll hang down here and play. So that's why I say be very careful, because this stuff is hard to break. And it goes back to the one before, right? Question the source. Who's told you what you are? Who's defined you in this way? And you might think it's an odd story, and you might think you're the only one going through it. But when I've interviewed so many of these great people, they all have stories like this. People define them as something early on that took them a long time to break out. So that's why I say you got to think about it. What do you think of yourself? Is it true? Who told you that? Question that source. And use those difficulties and failures as motivation. By the way, can I give you one other little nugget here? Like I told you guys, this book right here, Missouri Legends, that was the first book that I ever had came out. That's now being taught in the school that told me I was slow. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. I found out they're teaching my book. Oh, you're teaching the slow kids book, huh? <laughs> Again, I didn't get bitter. There's no reason to get bitter. You know, the whole get, don't get bitter, get better, right? Use that as your motivation, but you can't blame others for cases like that. And I'll leave you with this. Take life seriously and know your why. Life is short. I know when you're in this, this has been a long hour for some of you. I get it. Life is short. Like I, I sometimes say, I feel like I'm closer in your age group than I am to retirement, but that's not true. <laughs> it's gone so fast. I feel like I should be hanging out with you guys down on the square tonight. Um, you're right? <laughs> After this. Um, so again, take life seriously, because if you're going to have to work for a living, and let's be honest, most people are going to have to work for a living, right? Be the best employee you can be. If you want to be a stay-at-home mom, a stay-at-home dad, be the best one you can be. It's really that simple and know your why. And I'm going to tie a little Disney in here to wrap it all up because Walt Disney is from right here in Missouri. I've done a lot of work with Disney over the years and their approach to business and life is so unique that when you hear how they do things, it's again, light bulbs going off. One of the executives I spoke with from Disney said, our reality is that we take everything very seriously, no matter how small. So here's how this plays out in real life. So the show up there, we we're getting ready to unveil one of their new rides, right? So we did our whole morning show at Disney. We're down there at 3 a.m. because it's a morning show. And I see them cleaning up the streets, right? I'm like, wow, people are going to love this video. I'm getting ready to do a, you know, some social media stuff, show people Disney after dark, right? You're going to see some stuff. So I see a street sweeper going by and somebody you know, cleaning up a building. And I snap the picture, right? Disney magic. There's a security guard right over my shoulder. I'm like, whoa. Where'd you come from? He said, did you just take a picture? And I said, yeah. I said, this is going to be good on social media. He said, I'm going to need you to delete it. And yeah, I was a guest. I wasn't going, to be, <laughs> wasn't going to do anything. I'm like, OK, sure. I said, but why? He said, because we don't want people to see this place when it's not perfect. You know, do you want to blow the illusion for millions of kids around the world? I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I love Disney. <laughs> why would I do that to the kids? But something as simple as that, right? The security guard is bought into the culture that everything has to be done in a perfect fashion, that even me doing something as simple as taking a picture of them cleaning up trash was off limits. We're getting ready to do this show right here. This was the grand opening of Star Wars Weekend when they first started that. There were some people doing some stuff back here. They were still getting the park ready. The guy who was overseeing us from Disney says, we got to stop this. We're about 30 seconds from going on the air. And we have the guy from Disney saying, you guys are not going on the air. We're on their property. There's not much we can do about it because it wasn't perfect. And he said, we have to do that. It has to permeate the culture because that's people's expectation when they come to Disney. 
You don't come to Disney to see a bunch of trash laying on the street, right? Here's one of the stories that, um, that I love. So I've written a couple of books, Walt Disney's in some of these books. One of the most amazing stories about Walt Disney is the way he designed the Disney parks, right? He wanted things to always look perfectly. So the one thing he didn't want was for there to be trash everywhere. So what Walt Disney did was he stood at the front and he handed kids candy. He wanted to see how far they would walk before they threw it on the ground. So you have kids, you know, and adults, piece. you look for a trash can, you got one of those huge turkey legs, you're like, oh, there's no trash can, right? Just drop it. So they started tracking to see how far people would go. They came up with 27 steps. People typically walk 27 steps with a piece of trash in their hand before they throw it on the ground. So when you go to Disney today, anybody want to guess how far apart the trash cans are? About 27 steps. Something as simple and as minor as that, he said that's important because we have this aura that we're trying to project. And we can't have a little stain messing everything up. He took it that seriously and that's the culture that's permeated the entire, the entire operation. And finally, I leave you with this one, know your why. Why do you want to do what you want to do? I had so many people in the earlier classes saying, how did, how did you do that? You know, why did you, why did you become that? And I said, you know what, no one ever came up to me and said, why do you want to be a doctor? You know, it's probably one of those questions you don't want to ask somebody, why, why, why are you trying to become a teacher? Why do you want to become an accountant? You know, have you thought through your why? Do you know why you're pursuing this path? And you have to be very clear about it. And you don't have to know, that's the other good thing, you don't have to know immediately. I didn't know for several years. And I use this analogy, and this makes it very, very clear. See, if you know your why, if you know where you're going, it's just like having a destination, right? We've talked about goals, we've talked about the, the procedures. So if I'm in New York, and I say I want to get to LA, all right, there's my why, so how do I get there? Well, I have to get a map. I have to find out how to get from New York to Los Angeles. Okay, I have the map, then what do I do? I gotta get moving. Because a lot of times what you'll find as you go through your career is you'll find somebody who says, yeah, I want to go to LA. Do you, have, do you know how to get there? Yeah, yeah, I got the map. But I'm going to sit here on the couch because there's a few obstacles in the way. Right? Some people say, well, I'd like to go out there, but you know, I'm going to wait until all the lights are green to drive all the way across. I'm going to make sure my path is easy. You know, I'm, just, I'm, a, I'm going to go down this path because I understand this and my parents like it and everything else. And so I'm going to go down that path because all the lights are green. But what you find out is you're never going to find all the lights green from New York to L.A. You have to get up. You've got to start moving. You get to this one. Light's green. You move on. You get to the red light. You get to a detour. You say, oh, I've got to go down towards Dallas. You get there. Oh, my goal's over here. You're back on the right path. And what happens is along the way, you pick up new experiences. You pick up new opportunities. You meet new people. Some guy says, hey, try the taco joint down on uh, Rodeo Drive. It's fantastic. Right? You're not going directly out there, but the obstacles that you run into and the challenges you have to overcome all make the trip that much better because when you get there, you're that much smarter and you're that much wiser. So don't be afraid to get started. It really is as simple as those three things. Know your why. Where are you going? What's the plan? Set the goals. Get there. And then finally, you have to get moving. You have to work harder than the people who you're against. If you want to rise up, that's the only way. And it's been proven time and time and time again. I mean, Dave Ramsey put it this way. He said, the best witness you can have is to have a life that others want to emulate. You know, I could preach to you guys and say, you have to do this, this, this. That doesn't work in these days anymore. You guys on social media and as savvy as you are in media, you see a fraud all the way through, right? So I can't say you need to do this and then not do that myself and you guys think, well, that'll work. No, what works is you see somebody where it's working really, really well. And you say, I don't know what's going on with that guy over there, but his career's going well. His family's going well. All this stuff is going well. I don't know what he's doing, but I probably ought to go in that direction and find out more about it. That's the best witness you can have is to have this kind of life to where you're rising up, moving up, and seeing progress in your own life. But it all does start with working harder on yourself than you do on the job. So I'll leave it at that. You know what, 20 years, 25 years, whatever it might be at this point, <laughs> it's, been, it's really been an amazing ride. I've had some unusual opportunities. Weird things have happened along the way. But being around some of these people who have risen to the very pinnacle of their career in entertainment, media, business, whatever it might be, they all have these same kind of themes. And so I challenge you, you know, you, like I said, you're not going to remember all this unless you took notes or record it and you can watch it on YouTube later, right? But take some of these nuggets and start incorporating them and say, well, that didn't work for me. Well, find something else. Find something that does work for you, but get started. Because trust me, it's worth it. 
Because 20 years from now, they might give you a call and say, hey, we need you to come home. Can you give a free speech? <laughs> and here you'll be back home. Guys, thanks again. I know I ran a little bit late. I do apologize. I hope you guys got something out of it. I know some of you got to run. If you have any questions, I'll be up here to answer any questions for you guys as well. Thanks again. Appreciate you guys. Thank you.